remain seated there. Ezekiel chapter 33. The pastor asked me to preach uh, when he was gone, and my first thought was, okay, let's go back to Mark. But Mark is done. And uh, so I was like, I don't know what to do. And he said, well, the Bible's pretty big, so I'm sure you can figure it out. <laughs> so I appreciate the encouragement from pastor there to figure it out. So here we are. Ezekiel chapter 33. One of, the, one of the good things about preaching through a book is you know the history of the book. And so you kind of know what's going on. You have a, a very familiar, familiarity with that book. And you kind of you know where all the characters are. You know what the characters are going through. And so I was praying about it. And I thought, Lord, I don't know where you want me to go. And he put Ezekiel 33 on my heart. And so I knew this is where God would have us be. The only problem is we are 33 chapters into a book. And it's a big one. And so there's a lot that has gone on up into this point. And so really, if you want to understand this chapter towards the end of this book, you have to know really what has happened up into this point. It'd be be really weird to come into a movie and just with 15 minutes left in a movie, just sit down and say, all right, well, here we go. I mean, nobody would have any clue what's going on. Or you wouldn't really care about the characters because there's no emotional tie, there's no background, there's really nothing there. And so as I read this section of the scripture, um, I begin to study it out and I I understand what the idea here is, but there's no real knowledge of what's happened up until this point. And so uh, obviously I've read through this, I know the story here, but when you really study it out, you, you kind of have a more intimate relationship with the book and you understand kind of what's going on. And so I spent a lot of time learning uh, Ezekiel. Now, the truth is we could be here for, uh, what, Mark took five years, three, five years, whatever that was. So Ezekiel, 33 chapters, about 17 years we would be to this point worth of uh, my preaching anyway. Um, But I think we're going to try to do this in about 17 minutes. So we'll try to give you that instead of a three or four hour message here this morning. We're going to be in Ezekiel chapter 33. We'll start reading in verse 1. The Bible says this, Again the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speaking to Ezekiel, speak to the children of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for their watchman, If when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, when whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took, uh, he, he heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. But if the watchman see the sword come, And blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned. If the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth, and shalt warn them from me. When I say unto the wicked, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die, If thou dost not speak to warn the wicked from his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Nevertheless, if thou thou warn the wicked of his way to turn from it, and if he turn not from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. One thing I do want us to see before we go on any further, every time Jesus, or Jesus, every time Uh, God is speaking to Ezekiel, what's happening is he's saying this, they are accountable for their own life, but I am holding you accountable to deliver a message. So the watchman's job is to sound the alarm. If, if, If an attack is coming, he has to sound the alarm. And if he does sound it and they choose not to do anything with it, then that's on them. If he doesn't sound the alarm and something happens to them, He's very clear to say they will die in their iniquity, but I will require it at your hand. And that's very important that we understand that because ultimately there is a level of personal responsibility 
that happens with every person that is alive. And if they're in that city, they are responsible for themselves. But it is the watchman's job to sound that alarm. Okay? And so that's where we're at. Verse 10, Therefore, O thou son of man, speak unto the house of Israel, thus ye, thus ye speak, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn away from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Let's pray and then we'll get into the message this morning. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. God, I pray that you will be with us this morning. God, I pray that you'll just help this message to be clear. It can be kind of wordy in some areas and and uh, it could be kind of confusing. So Lord, I pray that you'll just help me to, uh, to be able to navigate through the wordiness of this passage. And Lord, I pray that ultimately your message will be clear and that we will hear it, uh, Lord, from you this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Like I said, if we're going to really truly understand what's going on in Ezekiel chapter 33, we have to know what happened in the 32 chapters before. And so Ezekiel is really a, a, a fascinating character. He's really a unique prophet from the Lord because God called Ezekiel to be his man. And so we saw in, in the first verse or the second verse that God referred to him as the son of man. So we, we see that God is choosing to speak to his children through Ezekiel. Now, what's fascinating about Ezekiel is this, that God said, you're going to be uh, my mouthpiece, essentially. You're going to be my watchman in chapter 3, and he says this, I want you to go and tell them the words that I have for them. So I'm going to use you directly as my mouthpiece to deliver my message. And so that's the plan from the very beginning of this, of this book. And really God uses him in a variety of different ways. If you know the story of Ezekiel, you know that God had Ezekiel shave half of his hair, just half. Now, I don't know, uh, it, like, it would probably be like this half as opposed to this half. Now, in, in our world, if, I mean, if, honestly, if you're just looking up here, it kind of looks like this half fell down to this half. So I don't think he shaved this half and kept this half. But what he did was he shaved half of his hair and he chopped it up with a sword. And that was to signify that the judgment of God was coming. Another way that he was used was he laid on his side for over a year and didn't move for over a year, just laid there. Now, I don't know about you, but if I lay in my bed on my side for 20 minutes, I'm like, oh, and I have to roll over that way. And I'm just 31, so I understand it's only going to get worse from here. For a year, he laid on his side. Another time, God used him to build a model of Jerusalem, and he laid down and put a cast, uh, like a cast iron skillet, essentially between him and and the city, thus signifying that God is now separated from his people. And so God used Ezekiel in really unique ways and, and odd ways, quite frankly, in comparison to some of the other prophets. But God was using him to ultimately tell the children of Israel that there is a problem. There's a problem here. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. See, God had a covenant with the children of Israel, and the covenant that God had put in place with the children of Israel, was essentially a marriage covenant. And so God's design was this, that you will be my people and I will be your leader. I will be your God. I will be here for you. I am choosing to use you solely to ultimately bring forth the, the Messiah. And so God's design was that he was going to use the Jewish people to ultimately one day bring a Messiah so that all men could come to repentance, so that all men could know God. And so God chose the, the children of Israel way back in the time of Moses, really around the, the Ten Commandments is when God set this covenant in place to say, hey, you are my people and I am your God. And essentially they were saying, there is no other God for you but me. And I'm telling you, there is no other people for me than you. Now, that being said, this was not about the salvation to all men was not available. It was only available to the Jews. It was this idea that God was going to send the Messiah through the lineage of the Jews. And that was the covenant that they made. And the children of Israel had a problem. 
They didn't do what God told them to do. Uh, if you've got children, you understand exactly how this goes. You tell them what to do, and they don't do it. I mean, this is just life. This is how this works. But that's kind of what happened here with the children of Israel. God said this, I want you to go into the land, and I want you to drive out all of the people. In Judges chapter 2, what he, he ultimately tells them is this, you were supposed to come into the land, drive out all the inhabitants of the land, and the reason they're supposed to get rid of everybody is because the people of the land would be a thorn unto them, but ultimately what would be a snare unto them was their gods, the false gods. And so the reason God said, when you get this land of Canaan that I have given to you, I want you to drive everybody out, not because I'm afraid of the people, and not because I'm afraid of false gods, but it was this, that if you don't drive out the people, they'll always be a pester. I don't know if you've had a, a thorn or a, a splinter or something like that. It's, it's not going to kill you, but it's, it's going to be annoying. and It's going to be frustrating. And so he said the people are going to be a frustration to you if you don't completely drive them out. But what's going to absolutely destroy you, what's going to be a snare unto you, is their gods. Because what's going to happen is this. Your daughters are going to marry their sons. And, and our sons are going to marry their daughters. And what's going to happen is the in-laws are going to be involved, and then it's going to be a sticky situation, and we all know how that goes. And ultimately what's going to happen is the, the false gods are going to creep into the lives of the children of Israel. And that's not okay. Why? Well, Because they're married. They have a God. It's not okay to cheat on your spouse. And that's what happens when the children of Israel are going to serve these false gods. And so in the book of Judges, there's this cycle. And you're familiar with this cycle. There's this living in sin. They cry out for a deliverer. They get a deliverer like a Samson or a Gideon or a Shamgar or whoever it might be. And then they get this deliverer and then they live in peace and they love God and they worship God. And then all of a sudden, before too long, a couple years later, they fall back into worshiping these false gods and they cheat again. And so God sends another deliverer and another and another. And it's just this awful cycle of messing up and getting right and saying I'm sorry and living in victory and messing up and, and, and you know, just over and over and over and over. And finally they say, well, we just need to be like everybody else and we need a king. We just want a king. Now the problem with that is this, God had a design to be their king. He, had a, he wanted to be their leader. Now, eventually God was going to give them a king, but that was God's decision of when, and God wanted to be their leader. So he wanted to be their king. He wanted them to come to him, and then he would give direction, and that's what they would do. But they said, no, we want to be like the other nations. And so they picked a king, a man head and shoulders over everybody else, a man who, if you looked at him, would be, wow, he's impressive physically dominant. I mean, just, he's a great guy. So they pick Saul to be their king. And they forsake God again and say, we want him to be our king. Ultimately, God decides to choose a man after his own heart to be the king. And now we have the king that the children of Israel have chosen and an anointed king that God has anointed in David. And then we get into the life of David and it's chaos. And the, the, the land of Israel is just absolutely messed up. And they, they fall and they serve false gods. And if you look at the children of David and the lineage that goes on, and then there's a split in the kingdom. And the southern kingdom has a couple good kings, but overall they're, they're bad kings. The northern king, kingdom never actually has a good king at all. And so every king that comes just does evil in the sight of the Lord. And so ultimately it's just this falling away and falling away and falling away and choosing to serve Baal and choosing to, to do wrong and wrong and wrong and wrong is just a downward spile of just absolute terrible decisions. Now, in our world today, if, if a spouse were to cheat on their spouse, there would be a natural tendency to say, okay, well, I'm done. A one time is all it takes. And, and many times people would look at that and have sympathy and say, hey, they, they have the right to leave or whatever that might be. But I want you to see this. This is not a one-time adultery, if you will. This is not a one-time decision for the children of Israel to leave God and go and serve false gods. 
This was a cycle through the judges. This was a cycle, king after king after king after king after king. We're talking about hundreds of years of adultery. Hundreds of times of essentially the children of Israel cheating on God. And the reason we have to understand that is because when we get into the book of Ezekiel, we deal with God's judgment. And a lot of times we, we look at this and we go, oh my goodness, how could God judge these people? But what we need to understand is this. There has been long suffering and grace given over and over and over hundreds and hundreds of years. This has been going on. And ultimately, God says, judgment has to happen. It has to happen. And that's where we are in the book of Ezekiel. In the first couple chapters, Ezekiel is actually taken away captive in the first attack of Babylon on Jerusalem. And so the, the real destruction of Jerusalem and the, the destruction of Israel by Babylon was in 586 B.C. This would have been several years before that. This first run of Babylon running into the city was when Ezekiel was actually taken out of the city and taken in captivity over to Babylon. And so about 10 years later, uh, Ezekiel is in Babylon. And that's where he receives this vision from God as he's in Babylon. And what he sees is this, ultimately, is the presence of God in Babylon. Now, that's super interesting to me because really the presence of God has always been in the temple up until this point. It's, it's always been in Jerusalem and, and over there in the temple. And we are getting really close to 586 B.C. Actually, in this chapter, right after where we stopped reading, is when Babylon goes back in and absolutely annihilates Jerusalem, tears the temple down, absolutely destroys the city, and there's nothing left. And so we're right up into this point. And so Ezekiel gets this vision, and he, he sees the presence of God in Babylon, and it's no longer in Jerusalem. And the reason that it's no longer in Jerusalem is because the children of Israel have broken this covenant with God so many times that God now has has left, his presence has left Jerusalem, and it's now with his people in captivity. And that's the vision that he sees. And so there's going to be serious repercussions that come when this judgment comes. Ultimately, the beauty and the amazing nature of God is this, that even, even after all of this has happened in the lives of the children of Israel, in chapter 11, God promises a remnant. And God says, even though you have messed up, and even though you've done wrong continuously, and even though we have a covenant and you've chosen to break it over and over and over and over again, I will provide a remnant. Even in God's wrath, he shows grace. But there has to be a time of judgment. And so through several books of, or several chapters of Ezekiel, there's the judgment of, of comparing um, the judgment of Israel and the comparing of Israel to a lot of different pictures and categories. And then you get into the destruction of other uh, areas around Israel, like Egypt and other countries as well. And then we get here to chapter 33, right before Babylon is about to go in and absolutely annihilate Jerusalem. The Bible says this, again, the word of the Lord came unto me saying. So now God speaks to Ezekiel one more time. Son of man. Speak to the children of thy people and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon the land, if the people of the land take a man of their coast and set him for a watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land and he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and he took not warning. His blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh the warning shall deliver his soul. So what God says to Ezekiel is this. He says, you are familiar with the idea of a watchman. And so there's a watchman set up in Jerusalem. And the, the, the purpose of this watchman was to stand on the gate and to watch, to see when enemies would attack. The purpose was to call or uh, sound uh, with a trumpet that, hey, somebody's attacking. We need to get soldiers in place to come for battle. We need to make sure that we 
put away the women and children and make sure that we get away from this danger that's about to come onto our city. And so this watchman would stand on the wall and he would keep an eye out. Now, we're very familiar with this. We, we understand this analogy. I mean, if you don't understand this analogy, it's this. Uh, bad guys are coming. Oh, there's bad guys. I'm going to blow the trumpet. And so he, what God says is this. If that watchman blows the trumpet and people on the inside hear the trumpet and they don't care, they don't do anything about it, well, then that's on them. Duh. I mean, what are you doing? You heard the trumpet. You heard the warning. This is on you. It's not the watchman's fault. He did everything he could. He said this, but if the watchman doesn't blow the trumpet, oh my goodness, there's an army coming. They're attacking. There's an ambush. I'm out of here. And he just protects himself and gets out of town. What a terrible person. I mean, quite frankly, what, I mean, what a coward to only worry about himself and not worry about anybody else and all he has to do is blow on a trumpet, and then he can take off, but he doesn't even do that. It might even be that he just sees it and doesn't care. Uh, these guys deserve it anyway. What a terrible person. I mean, think about this type of person. It might be that this person's sleeping. They didn't even see it. He's supposed to be on watch, and he's up on the gate and props himself up in a little corner of this gate and just goes to sleep. And the army comes and attacks and the watchman's not prepared or not ready to sound the alarm. Whatever the case might be, if he does not sound the alarm, anybody who dies in that city, their blood is on his hands. Because he had a job to do and he didn't do it. Really a basic concept here that really is pretty understandable. It doesn't take too much explanation here. But what God says is this, Ezekiel, you're my watchman. You're my watchman. Now, I've been in situations when we work with teenagers where I have been a watchman, if you will. Okay, And so now there's times when I have to deal with teenagers and whatever, we go through all these types of things. But I was thinking through this, and I was reminded of a time when I was in the youth department. So back in Cincinnati, Ohio, at Kazaddale Baptist Temple, I was excited because it was time for me to go to camp, my first year of camp. Oh, I was excited. I could not wait. Uh, I finally met my new youth pastor. I was seventh grader. Actually, at this point, I was sixth grader, but I was allowed to go. It was a weird deal where they let sixth graders go. Standing in my position now, what was wrong with them? I have no idea to let a sixth grader go to camp, but whatever. I'm in sixth grade. I'm going to camp, and it, it's exciting. It's exciting times, and this youth pastor has been here for a long time. The youth group that we're a part of that I now join is about 75 to 100 people, uh, teenagers, not pe just teenagers. So this guy was, had to be in and over his head. I can't even imagine 100 teenagers. But I come into this class, and it's just moving, and things are happening. It's exciting. I'm excited to see what's going on. Uh, classic seventh grade fashion, I come in, and not knowing who I am as a person but wanting to be accepted, was unbelievably annoying. I mean, it just, there's no two ways about it. I was frustrating, I was annoying, but I was just excited to be there. So my mom picked me up, and for whatever reason, there was a weird split at camp this year where I was the only one going. No siblings were going. I have uh, two brothers and two sisters. I don't know how it happened, but I was the only one going to camp. So my mom picks me up and wakes me up at like four in the morning or something ridiculous. It was probably like 8.30 or something. <laughs> But I get up and I'm thinking, oh, this is ridiculous. I got my bag. I'm excited, but I'm tired. We get in the van. We go to the church and there's kids everywhere. We've got like three buses lined up. And of course, like two of them broke down on the way to camp because that's what happens with church buses. And so we get on the bus and I'm excited. And this is the first time I'm ever leaving home. Ever. And something happened within me. And I was like, I'm tough but I miss my mommy, but I'm, I'm in the youth group now. This is the first time I've ever left, and I'll, I'll never forget getting on that bus, and I'm excited. I see all my friends. I'm high-fiving people, and they're like, get out of here, kid, and I was just like, this is awesome. I'm so excited. I sit down, and I look out my window, kind of breathing in fog. You know, it's like, whoo, goes away, whoo, kind of the fog on the window, and I look up, and my mom's just standing there. I'm like, keep it together. Keep it together. 
But on the inside, I'm like, I'm never going to see her again. I don't know why I thought that, but that's where my mind was. I'm like, no. And so I'm just, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. We pull away on our way to camp. And not, I mean, I'm excited. So three seconds later, as soon as we get off the property, I'm like, oh, cool, spit wads or something. And it's just, I completely forgot about it. But we get down there to camp, and right before we go in, the youth pastor stands up on the bus, and he goes, okay, sixth graders and seventh graders, here's the deal. There's like 30 of you, and we're glad you're here, but I've been doing this for a long time, and I am not your mommy. So you will brush your teeth, you will shower, and you will go to dinner. Other than that, I don't care about you. And I was like, is this boot camp? Like, what is happening? Of course he did, but what he was trying to say is this, I'm not going to hold your hand to make sure that you're doing everything you need to do. Take a shower. Please take a shower. Brush your teeth and go to dinner. And so I remember the first time we get there, and I, of course, I'm, I'm like 12 years old or something, and like any young person who goes to camp, you give them $5, and they're like, oh, yes, uh, let me go in here, and I'm going to make my bed like they do all the time at home. They don't. And so, but they get there to camp, they make their bed, everything's all, their shoes are in line, and it's like, you should, why don't you do this at home? You don't do this at home. We know you don't, but there's this independence, and like, I have arrived, so I get there, I'm setting up all my stuff, and then my youth pastor comes in, and he says, hey, it's dinner time. Go, we got to go eat lunch. And I'm sitting here thinking, well, I've got to take care of my stuff first. Now, what he told us on the bus is, I'm not going to hold your hand. So you're going to be there when you're supposed to be there, or you don't eat. And that's just it. I don't care. I'm, I'm going to eat. And so I'm getting all my stuff lined up, and then I get a buddy. He says, they have basketball courts. Let's go play. Awesome. So I go over to my perfectly manicured area, get my shoes, and I run outside, and I play basketball. And then it's time for the service. And so he cared about the service. He lied to us. He said, brush your teeth, take a shower, eat. But he made us go to church too. So he cared about at least one more thing in that, that week as well. So he says, hey, you two, you got to get up here. So we go up there and sit in the service, and I'm about song services going on or whatever. We sit down, and he, the preacher's getting ready to start. Stomach starts yelling, like, you're hungry. What are you doing? Just absolutely hungry. And I'm like, hey, uh, youth pastor, I'm like starving. Well, did you go to dinner? Yeah, so something came up, and uh, I, I was busy. So you were playing basketball? Yeah, but why didn't you tell me there was dinner? I told you there was dinner. Well, why didn't you, why didn't you like come and drag me to dinner? Because I'm not your mom, and I'd be quiet and pay attention. Okay, and so I didn't get dinner. First day of camp. I got dinner every other day after that. No, no doubt about it. Got breakfast, too, and every other meal. But you know what happened was my youth pastor was my watchman, if you will, and he said this, hey, it's dinner time. And I got distracted. And I said, ah, I'm going to go play basketball with my buddy. Ah, I'm an independent man. I've got $5. I can live on that all week. Bought like 14 Slim Jims for dinner that night. It's not on my youth pastor that I didn't have dinner. You understand? That's on me. Did he sound the warning? Yes. He said, it's dinner. If I choose to go or not, that's not on me. Well, what a terrible youth pastor. Well, I'm just telling you that if your kid doesn't go to dinner at camp, it's their fault. I, I haven't brought all of those tendencies to uh, what I do here, but there, we might have had a kid or two not eat dinner one night or so, but they learned, right? So that's the, that's the example here of the watchman is this. He did his job. He did his job to say, it's dinner time. And if I chose not to listen, then I chose not to listen. So who's that on? Well, it's not on him. It's on me because I chose to do what I wanted to do at that moment. And so God says to Ezekiel, you are my watchman. And so I want you to tell these people what I want them to hear. And if you don't tell them, then that's going to be on you. But if you do tell them, then you do the job that I want you to do and you're fine. And so he says, when I say to the wicked in verse 8, O wicked man, thou shalt surely die. If thou dost not speak and warn the wicked of his way, that wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. So what God says to Ezekiel is this, I've got bad news for the children of Israel. It's not news that you want to tell them. It's not news that you want to take to them. 
But the problem is this, they have broken my covenant and there's judgment coming. And so even though the judgment is coming and it will come, I am going to use you to sound the alarm and I'm giving them an opportunity to turn from their wicked way. I'm giving them an opportunity to make the right decision. But if you don't go and do what you're supposed to do because the message is not going to be good or because they're not going to receive the message that you have for them, and nobody likes to get bad news, and this is bad news that he has to give. And so he says, if you don't go and give them the bad news, then guess what? I will require their blood on your hands. Now, again, I want to be clear. Whose fault is it? It's the people who broke the covenant. It's their fault. But God is using this watchman to say, hey, this is your last chance. Make the right decision. And if you don't do that, then I'm going to require their blood on your hands. Nevertheless, if thou warn the wicked of his way, verse 9, to turn from it, if he do not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity. But thou hast delivered thy soul. Here's your job. If you want to do what you're supposed to do, this is, what, this is, this is it. When I speak to you, you speak to them. Here's the message that I have. You deliver the message, and you're not accountable any longer. That's it. That's it. These, these words are not from you. This message is not from you. This message is from me. Whether it's good news or bad news, I don't care. Your job is this, deliver the message. And if you do it, that's all I care about. Verse 10, therefore, thou son of uh, man, speak unto the house of Israel, Thus she speaks, saying, If our transgressions and our sins be upon us, and we pine away in them, how should we then live? Basically, what he's saying is this. These children of Israel have been wasting away in this decision to leave God and to serve false gods. And if they're just abounding in it and wasting away in this decision, what's the point? Why even tell them? They've had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And they've chose to live in this way. They know better. There's been watchmen before. There's been people who have told them before. I mean, how many judges did you give them? How many kings did you give them? How many opportunities did you give them to, to make the right decisions? They know better, but they're choosing to just waste away in this decision. Why are we even doing this? Why are we even taking the time? Well, verse 11 tells us the heart of God. Verse 11 says this, Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God does not want this to happen. But, but his, his, his goal is this, that the wicked turn away from his, uh, turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? You see what God's saying to the children of Israel? He's saying this, I am trying to give you opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to make the right decision, but you're just choosing to be there. It's not my desire that the wicked should perish. I'm trying to give you an out. We are like five verses away from Babylon destroying everything. This is the watchman on the tower. He is the watchman on the tower, and the attack is on the way, and this is his job. Turn from your wicked ways. Wrath is coming. Judgment is coming. And if you don't make the right decision, it's going to be on you. It's not going to be on me. I am standing as the army approaches to tell you, turn from your wicked ways. This is God's desire. This is God's plan that you turn back. He does not receive, he doesn't get some kind of gratification when the wicked die. He did, God wasn't happy to see these people die in their sin. He wasn't happy to see them die, these, these people who have cheated on him hundreds of times. He wasn't happy to see them get theirs, if you understand what I'm saying. He wasn't happy to see that. It was his desire. It was his design and his plan that they turn from their wicked ways. He's saying, you don't have to die like this. Make the right decision. Just do what you're supposed to do. And if you do it, you'll be saved. And yet they chose not to. This is where they are. And it's amazing how somebody could be in a position where their life is in ruins. And when they're given an opportunity to make a right decision, they just say, ah, whatever. 
and they just do what they're going to do. God says this, Ezekiel, you're my watchman. It's your job to stand there and just tell them. I have a message for you to share. You have to share it. Now, what's amazing about this is in chapter 3, God told Ezekiel, they're not going to listen to you. They're going to hate you. He said, I'm going to make your head like a flint. That means this, that no matter what comes your way, I'm gonna, you're going to be able to stand there and take it. Because they're going to attack you. They're going to hate you. They're not going to listen to you. But it's still your job to go. And, and Ezekiel, you're going to be scared to take this message to these people. But I'm here with you, and I'm going to help you be the watchman that you're supposed to be and deliver the message that you're supposed to deliver. Even if they don't like you, and even if they won't listen. You stand there, and you stand firm, and you deliver the message. The truth is that, that Babylon is not attacking the United States of America. Right, the country of Babylon. There's no Nebuchadnezzar who's going to come over here and, you know, box Joe Biden or something. It's just not going to happen, right? But there is a message from God to this land. And the truth is this. They don't like the message. They don't want the message. They're not going to like you. They're not going to want anything to do with it. God told us that. They're going to hate you because they hate me. That's what Jesus said. He was talking to us about that. They're going to hate us because they hate him. So not everybody's going to listen to the message that we have. Not everybody's going to accept the message that we have. But I believe that God gives us the ability to stand with our heads like a flint. The idea there is like a buffalo, like an American buffalo we could equate that to. They just they stand there. You're not going to budge a buffalo. I mean, it's, you can punch it right in the forehead, and it's just like, why did you do that? Like, there's nothing there. And so that's the idea. Is you're going to stand here, you're going to deliver a message, and there's going to be backlash. But you can stand there. And they're not going to like it, but you can stand there. And they're not going to accept it. Nobody's going to listen to you, but your job is to stand there. Well... Nobody likes being rejected. Nobody likes being told no. Nobody likes being hated. Nobody likes doing that. But you're a watchman. And you have to blow the trumpet. Because if you don't blow the trumpet, it's on you. Is this what God is saying here? It's on you if you don't blow the trumpet. Well, what if I blow the trumpet and nobody listens? Then that's on them. You have to blow the trumpet. This is your job. You are a watchman. It doesn't matter what people do. It doesn't matter what they do with their decision in their life. That's up to them. It is, it is God's will that no man make the wrong decision. It's God's will that all men come to repentance. It's God's will that everybody make the right decision. So what's our job? Our job is to stand on the tower like a flint and blow the trumpet even though they're not going to listen, even though they're going to hate you, even though they're going to not like the message that you have, and even though they're going to claim tolerance but not be tolerant to you, I'm just telling you, your job is to stand there and blow the trumpet. Because if you don't, their blood is on your hands. Right. Now the truth is this. This message is the message that God loves this world and that he sent his son to die for the sins of this world so that all man can come to repentance and so that all evil, wicked men can turn from their wicked ways and turn to God. That is the message that we have to share with everybody around us. Like I said, they're not all going to listen, but that doesn't stop us from blowing the trumpet. It can't stop us from blowing the trumpet. We have to do it. We have to do it. Ultimately, it's on them. If they, even if you say, well, what if there's no watchman blowing a trumpet? It's on them. The Bible says creation proves that there is a God. So ultimately, it's on them. They will die in their iniquity, as the verse has said over and over and over and over. But I want to think about this, because I don't think we think about this a lot. Could it be that God has a plan 
for every human being on this planet to hear the gospel. I believe that that is true. I mean, I think that that's a foundational truth of Christianity is that every human has the opportunity to hear the gospel. Well, what about the people in a remote village in Africa? You know, that, that's a fair question. But I think what, really, it, what it really comes down to is this. God is calling watchmen. And watchmen have the choice whether they're going to blow the trumpet or not. How sad would it be if God called a watchman to be a missionary to Africa, to that tribe, and that missionary goes, that guy says you want me to be a missionary to Africa? That's literally like the scariest thing. That's what we use as an example of what might happen if you give your life to God. They literally say, he's going to call me to be a missionary to Africa. Do you want me to actually be that missionary to Africa? What if that watchman says, no. How many people have now lost an opportunity to hear the message that Jesus loves them? Do you understand what I'm saying here? How many youth camps do we go to where young people say, oh, God is speaking to me and he wants me to be a missionary or I know it, or he wants me to just serve him and live my life for him and I know that he wants to use me, but, oh, I really love basketball. I really have my own goals and ambitions and I'm just going to go. I'm going to go and do that. How many churches, how many pastors of churches are no longer there. You see, we see doors of churches closing all over this country every day. There's people, Brother Park Sutton at Youth Conference down in Oklahoma City, he spent a long time telling us about church after church after church, and when he goes out and people come up to him and say, do you know of anybody who's, who's pastoring? I just, we need a pastor. We haven't had a pastor for two years, and our church is just withering away. We have to have somebody. Can you send anybody down here? We'll take anybody. Well, I wonder why that church is in that position. Could it have been that a young person said, nah, and that was the church that he was supposed to pastor? Or that a young lady was supposed to be a pastor's wife for? All because they said, I'm not going to blow the trumpet. We look at a physical battle and say, what a terrible person. <laughs> what a terrible person would see an enemy charging and not go, <laughs> That's all you got to do. Why would you not do that? And yet here we have people in their workplace who are watchmen at their job, who are watchmen in their family, who are watchmen at their grocery store, who are watchmen at Starbucks, who are watchmen at the Home Depot, who are watchmen, do you understand what I'm saying? You are watchmen everywhere you go. It is your responsibility to sound the alarm. Well, they won't like it, or they won't, what if they don't like me, or what if they throw the track away? What if they say, no, I don't want that, or you're crazy, or this or that? Hey, I'm just telling you, we would get mad at the guy standing on a physical wall not blowing the trumpet when a danger is coming. I'm telling you, we have a more important message than some army attacking some city. We have the message of all time, the most important message, and that's this that people are dying in their sin and they need a Savior and Jesus loved them so much that he died for them so that they can have a relationship with a just and holy God and that's what this is all about. And these people are dying left and right and these people are people you work with every single day and these people are people you rub shoulders with. These are your neighbors in your neighborhood. These are your, your people that you, that you uh, go to class with or that you go to high school with or that you go to middle school with. These are people that we run into on a daily basis. And, and how sad is it that you're not blowing the trumpet? Now, I'm thankful that our church and our church people blow the trumpet and that we have a lot of people who care about their neighbors. We have a lot of people who care about their city. We have a lot of people who care about their schools. And I'm not saying that we're bad at it, but I am saying we can be better. That's just the truth. We can always be better. You're a watchman with the most important message of all time. If you don't blow the trumpet, their blood is on your hands. We have to tell people about the Lord. We have to do it. Well, how? 
look for opportunities. We've got a whole track rack of tracks, every different kind. We've got invitations to our church that have the gospel on the back. We have gift tracks. We have tracks that, that would help in, a lot of people in a lot, a lot of different areas of their life. All you've got to do is just hand it out. Does that count? Yeah, you're blowing the trumpet. That's it. We have to do better. We can't let fear stop us from giving the message. We have to share the message or it's on us. How sad would it be if we get to heaven and we've got blood on our hands because we didn't do what we were supposed to do when we were supposed to do it. I'm scared for that day. There's a lot of people I haven't given the gospel to that I should have. We've got to do better. Let's be watchmen for the Lord. Lord, thank you for the day. Pray to just be with us this morning as we have a time of invitation. Lord, the truth is we do have the most important message of all time, and that's this, that you loved us so much that you came and lived a perfect life and died for our sins. So, Lord, I pray that if there is somebody who's here this morning who has never accepted you as their Savior, they've never asked you to forgive them for their sins, they've never humbled themselves and believed and placed their trust in you, not in works or not in baptism or not in my mom goes to church or my grandma goes to church and they pray for me, nothing like that, but they have made a conscious decision that they are going to ask you to forgive them of their sin. It's, it's their sin that put you on the cross and it's their fault that you had to die and they've never acknowledged that before. Lord, I pray that as they hear this message, they'll feel that conviction, that that prick in their heart to say, this is for me. God, I pray that you'll help them to realize that they need you and that if they call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Lord, I pray for the majority of the people in this room who have accepted you as their Savior. Help us to be watchmen for you. Lord, I understand that it's, it's not easy. It's scary. There's times when it's it's scary of what our reaction might be. It's time, there's times where it's hard to just get out of our comfort zone and, and share the gospel in a way that we know we should share it. God, I pray that you'll just help us to be better. Give us the courage that we need and the grace that we need to be a watchman for you. God, I pray that you'll just be with our church. I thank you for this church and the willingness to be a watchman in this neighborhood and uh, in our schools and in our neighborhoods that we live in and in our workplace. Lord, we have visitors all the time of church members. Lord, I thank you for church members who are blowing the trumpet, sounding the alarm and inviting people and sharing the gospel. But Lord, I pray that you'll help us to just do better and be better. Lord, we can always do better for you. So Lord, I pray that you'll just be with this time of invitation. Use it to get honor and glory. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and eyes.